Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. Joining us is Grover Norquist, president of Americans for Tax Reform. He is the author of the new book, End the IRS Before It Ends Us. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Grover. Good to be with you. So before we get to your new book, I wanted to talk a little bit about your background and how you got into politics in Washington, D.C. What was your first political job that you ever had? I was in seventh grade. I went wow. down <laughs> to – I got on the train from 12 miles outside of Boston into Boston to go work on the Nixon campaign in 68. What made you such a believer? Is it just you loved the politics or were you already a fervent Republican at the no, time? No, I was an anti-communist. OK. And um, from there I decided I didn't like my government all that – my government all that much. But uh, so I was a <clears throat> Soviet's first anarchist. Get rid of theirs first and <laughs> start working on ours um, in terms of uh, size and scope of government. And maybe that would explain. So you went from – what did you, what did you do on the campaign as a kid? I as a kid, I was a kid. I sorted uh, addresses for people they were either trying to raise money from or get out the vote on. So they're basically they were three by five cards with addresses. Wow! And making sure they were all in databasing. Basically. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's yeah. In little in little boxes. It's <laughs> scary um, <laughs> how. Far we've come, or yes. <laughs> uh, uh, scary how far back we were. Yes. Mm. So, and you do work on every uh, campaigns in seventy two and seventy six. Uh, I did. I I worked on the congressional campaigns in what's it was the fourth congressional district in uh, Massachusetts. All of our unsuccessful efforts to defeat uh, Father Robert Drynan, mm. and uh, so I was involved in those. I'd, and then back in again after college uh, in eighty for the Reagan campaign. Okay, And you also worked at National Taxpayers Union, correct, before that? Yes. Well, as soon as I finished college, graduated in 78, I rented a van and I drove down with my stuff and uh, uh, James Dale Davidson's stuff that he had asked me to bring down from Boston uh, to D.C. to be the associate director, number two guy at the National Taxpayers Union and within a month or so, I was the executive director because the executive director moved down the street and that was the year of Proposition 13. So it was a real baptism in fire. It was uh, it was people call you know, you're, you're just out of college, you're 20 something and Time Magazine's calling for your opinions <laughs> out there. These guys have no idea what they're talking to. Uh, but you realize that there are no rules in politics. There's no age requirement. There's no license. You know, um, they can't tell you, you you can't do that. And first of all, the whole taxpayer movement was a bunch of people who didn't have permission to get involved in politics. If the people who had permission to get involved in politics had made all the decisions, they'd have just kept raising taxes. Uh, but you pro saw Prop 13 that year, and there were a dozen other states with initiatives, and I worked on all of them. Now, which one was Prop 13? Are you, are for Pro Proposition the 13 was California. Uh, cut the property tax uh, to a, a basically in, in half and then it limited the uh, growth of assessments uh, up 2 percent a year and it required a two-thirds vote to raise taxes. There are a bunch of very good pro solid protections there. Simple. So it wasn't one of these very complicated percentage of GDP measures which as interesting as they were, they were flawed because they were too complicated and they were hard to sell to people and hard to defend. Two thirds to raise taxes. Everybody gets it. Every gets two thirds is on purpose to be more difficult than half, and people can can do two thirds. If you do three fifths, they think it's counting slaves, and <laughs> they have to look at their fingers. Two thirds, they can imagine the pie. They get two thirds. It's a much more popular number than three fifths. It's a, this whole idea of you thinking about messaging and 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 what people get and, and what is a simple way of selling a limited government really ties into to the pledge. Uh, but before we get to the yeah. pledge and, and ATR, I, you all. Also, had a period where you were working with anti-Soviet guerrillas, which I wanted to ask you about. But with that, sure. Of During the Reagan years, I spent some time in Angola, uh, working against the Cuban Cubans there, uh, and helped to organize a meeting of the various resistance movements from uh, Central America, Africa, uh, Afghanistan, Laos, and uh, we did that in in Angola. Um, little 
conference. And I spent a little bit of time up on the border in, in Afghanistan. Um, not now a complete mess, but at the time it was uh, uh, a lot of concern about the Soviet Union and its present, its occupation at the time of Afghanistan. And was that a private? Th I mean, you did that just on your own, or was it through the government that you got involved with that? No, all, all on my own. It, it, uh, I did some writing and, and uh, uh, work with uh, Zavimbi mm -hmm. and uh, was trying to just be helpful, bring attention and, and support to uh, those political movements, which I think were very helpful in weakening the Soviet empire without costing the United States a lot of money, no American lives. Uh, not much American money compared to other ways to organize these things. Uh, and it bled the Soviet Union and eventually the Soviet Union collapsed and ceased to exist as an entity. So it was a, it was a smart move compared to other ways to have done things. What does such a meeting look like? I mean, I'm just curious. You've got you've got all these resistance. I'm picturing AK-47s involved in, uh, you know, in a room. I mean, what, yes. what, what does tanks? it look like? What do you what do you talk about? Like the well, it is interesting because everybody's got the, the the funny hats, right? The guy mm -hmm. from Afghanistan has the big military hat, and the guy from Laos is freezing because nobody told him that it got cold at night in the desert. <laughs> He's got this. Um, it was it was very interesting, and it was a great. I I, I drafted the joint declaration they put out. Um, I typed it on a Portuguese typewriter without looking down and the Portuguese typewriters transpose like T and S and R and M or something <laughs> so you get down your absolute gibberish as you look down. <laughs> uh, so you had to redo the whole thing. Uh, but it was, it was very interesting. Basically, it was making the case that this is a common cause, that, making the case that this was an anti-imperial movement just as existed – uh, in Latin America against Spain uh, as existed uh, throughout the world in the 60s against uh, Britain, France and uh, the Netherlands and, and the, Bel you know, the Belgians and the, and the various uh, imperial powers uh, and the remaining large imperial power was the Soviet Union and that was a big deal because that really bothered the Russians and the Soviets to think of themselves as an, an empire oppressing people. It wasn't just places like Cuba and Mozambique and, and Angola and, and Ethiopia, it was places like Ukraine and that's what really took them apart was that the idea that they had to cease to be a an imperial power. Now in, in 85, you started ATR um, at the – I always heard – is it the request or suggestion of Reagan? Uh, or? The White House put it together and then they asked me to run it. So okay. it's sort of like organizing for America uh, which the Obama people put together mm -hmm. and it's the, sort of uh, – it, we were the grassroots organizing campaign for – in support of what became the tax reform effort of, of 86. I don't know that they'd ever done that before. We, we never had a conversation about, oh, we did this for a trade bill or, oh, yeah, we did this for the first Kemp Roth tax cut. I think this was the first time out because hmm. uh, it was uh, not – put together the way I'd have organized it if I was running from the start. <laughs> uh, but it was a good start and we ran a campaign uh, in support of uh, lower marginal tax rates and I created the Taxpayer Protection Pledge as part of it because there were a lot of people who were worried that if you cut the rates, drove the rates down, broaden the base, over time the rates would creep back up and you'd lose even the protections of the deductions and credits. So the pledge was a written commitment to oppose raising rates or broadening the base unless it was revenue neutral or better. And we had 100 members of the House and 20 in the Senate who signed. That was enough to guarantee that they'd never go into a dark room and come out and say, we've got this tax increase. You have to eat it now. Uh, and we kept building on that to where after the 94 election, we had uh, 90 plus percent of all the Republicans and majorities in the House and the Senate. This pledge, I mean, politicians all the time stand up and say, I promise not to yeah. raise taxes or I promise to do this, that or the other thing and those those promises have no teeth. But the pledge seems to carry more weight than anything, other – Anything that I, even is comparable. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean what – why? Sure. There's I a mean. reason. One, it is one issue, one sentence, no net tax increase. And second, it's in writing and third – it's uh, without context. The reason why politicians can lie so easily and is that they're not completely lying. Taxes are the last thing we need to do. 
this is not the time to raise taxes. I think we should cut spending rather than raise taxes. None of those people promised not to raise your taxes. You heard them and you thought they weren't going to raise your taxes. What they were telling you is how pained they would be when they raised your taxes, um, that they wouldn't do it now. But now is OK. Uh, well, I said then was not the time, but now is the time. Uh, so the pledge – and if somebody in a speech says, I don't want to raise taxes, but five paragraphs before they said, I really cherish education, the guy will come back and say, did you not read the whole speech? In context, I was clearly going to spend through my nose and you should have seen that coming. The pledge is not attached to anything. It's disembodied. It is one sentence. It doesn't go away at the time we faxed it to people and now it goes online. And people can get copies of it, the press. The people would sign the big pledge. You take pictures. You hand copies of the signed pledge out. It was a way of saying, you know, this commitment doesn't disappear. There's no qualifier. There's no weasel word. Other people have like 25 question, 25 part questions or statements or um, yes, no things that they want on so many different issues and there are weasel words in there. We can't – I won't do too little. Or, you know, Unless too, necessary. Yeah. Or, what does yeah. that mean? So the reason it's so stark, it's also so moderate. So there's no tax increase. People would come for years. We weren't butting up against the need, the need, quote unquote, the demand for tax increase, and so people say you should you should change the pledge to be a cut ten percent. Well, if you move it around over time, it loses its power. So when the politicians came up against it in two thousand ten, two thousand eleven, and it held, saved us one point four trillion dollars. That's what the Obama people wanted as part of their tax deal, and what some people would have given them. But because we had the pledge, it protected. It also means you can't get enough Republicans to break with everybody else when so many have signed the pledge um, because one guy might want to break and we did have um, some unexpected people wanted to break. Uh, Coburn, who is very good on spending, not so good on taxes. Uh, but he, every time he'd run run out, he was in fact all by himself and had to come back. And, and so while people would have impure thoughts from time to time, nobody pulled the trigger on it. Doesn't something like the pledge though contribute to the problems in Washington if you're if you're tying the hands of these politicians? Like there may be you know emergency situations or instances where we just have to raise taxes, and suddenly you've got all these people who on a piece of paper, you know that. Said has has teeth are terrified to make those necessary compromises. Well, that, and that remind I had a friend, a leftist friend, who, when I told him I was I was doing this episode with you, so you should ask Rover. Sure. If right. he would would he relinquish the pledge in like a, an asteroid situation, right? <laughs> like basically the movie Armageddon. I mean, how, you know, because yes. he thinks that we just you know we're probably going to drive everyone over the cliff. Yeah, an asteroid's coming for the um, planet. Uh, raising taxes would help. How? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, good point. <laughs> I was going to kick out of here. There's Giant. been a flood. Everyone in town is poorer. We must now raise taxes. What? Now's yeah. the time not to raise taxes if everybody in town is now worse off. Uh, no, it's a very good question and the, the power of the pledge comes from the fact that the pledge is so simple. It's easy to understand and it's actually two parts. The first part is stated and the second part isn't. The first part is I won't raise taxes. The second part is when there's a problem, I will reform government to cost less. I will prioritize. I will govern. I will make decisions. We will spend more on this and less on that because we have this new situation. The, without the pledge, um, what politicians do is they simply paper over all existing problems with additional revenue and if they want to do something new, they don't stop doing anything old or dysfunctional or counterproductive. They just add the other on and you just – collect barnacles on, on the ship and taxes are what you do instead of governing. So the commitment not to raise taxes is a commitment to govern. The pledge drives the Paul Ryan budget reform. The pledge drives the sequester that, that caps government spending for the next decade and without the pledge, we wouldn't have had that. So um, don't raise taxes drives limit spending, drives reform government to cost less and 
saying you raise taxes is simply saying I won't reform government. It, it, uh, someone on the left would definitely say I mean, that, that's all well and good, but but the pledge is actually just an unwillingness to compromise, and an unwillingness to compromise is an unwillingness to govern with the other side. So that's why Republican obstinacy is such a problem, and it's the reason that our, our political system is is stuck in the mud. It says the party that won't agree to anything without a tax increase. Okay. Uh, no, they're just wrong. People who tell you that they look, they they wish for, they long for the good old days of bipartisan compromise, are telling you how old they are, <laughs> because many years ago, uh, the two parties didn't mean anything at all. They're just northern party and a southern party, and the fact that somebody was a Republican meant they were born north of the Mason Dixon line, and he didn't know anything else about them. They might want bigger government, smaller government. You didn't know. Uh, they, but they were born north of the Mason Dixon and everybody in the in Dixie was a Democrat, even though they may be conservative on some issues as opposed to left or, or, or liberal. During Reagan's lifetime, the two parties separated themselves out. One wants to be left alone in the key zones. One is a takings coalition that views the proper role of government as taking things from some people and giving them to others. And so instead of the old compromise, which was Nixon wanted the government to get bigger and Ted Kennedy wanted the government to get much bigger, very easy to compromise between bigger and much bigger. You get sort of bigger and you do that every year and the government over time gets quite large because you're compromising over the speed of moving in one direction. But we now have two parties, one of which actually wants smaller government and one of which clearly wants larger government. Somebody wants to go west. Somebody wants to go east. What in the heck would a compromise look like? It doesn't make any sense. And raising taxes is not compromising. It's losing. Isn't the pledge I – mean, you say that the pledge so that the no raising taxes part and then there's the second part which is you've got to govern. But isn't the pledge really just incentivizing, getting politicians to sure not raise taxes but instead just drive up deficits? Because it's not, it's not committing them to – It's not a spending. It's not a spending pledge. And so we get Republicans passing programs that are going like to Medicare cost Part more D, yes. uh, but, but then not paying for it. And so I mean are deficits worse, better than taxes? Well, you get the deficits. Taxes drive to the point – to the breaking point. All taxes are raised to the breaking point, to the point where politicians' careers are broken. Then they pull back. And the deficit, the debt – is driven to the breaking point, to the point where people lose elections over it. And so it's not as if raising taxes is instead of deficit spending. When uh, Clinton uh, raised taxes in 93 with only Democrat votes because we had everybody taken the pledge on the Republican side or almost everybody and not a single Republican voted for his tax increase, the projected deficits – under Clinton were $200 billion all the way through because they decided $200 billion is what they could survive politically. They raised taxes and then added the $200 billion and that was the budget path. Now, because they lost the House and Senate in 2004 and they couldn't do the spending they planned to, we actually ended up in balance. But that was not their plan. It wasn't that the revenue came in and balanced the budget. It was that spending was arced down because the spending they were planned, they weren't allowed. So no, the Democrats spend as much as they can get away with, including a certain amount that they think they can get away with for deficit. Uh, the establishment press screams when they think the deficit is caused by a tax cut and there is complete silence. I mean how often have you heard Tom Brokaw talk about Obama's deficits? Never. It's not a t discussion point because – and when I was at college, I was told that all this talk about 74 to 78, all this talk about deficits was a dirty trick by Republicans to stop deficit spending, which was a good thing. And so deficits was a dirty trick to talk about deficits. When deficits could be used as a weapon against tax cuts, then all of a sudden deficits became a big interest. Then when the Democrats under Clinton wanted to spend, deficits ceased to exist as an issue. It's what they use to try and stop lower taxes and they never use it to stop spending. With the pledge, um, you've, you've been called the most powerful man in Washington. Uh, you've been called many worse things uh, by many people. Um, yeah, that's a tough one to live in. Oh, stop being mean to me. <laughs> but it's, it, does it ever surprise you uh, it, that how well it's worked and, and, and the kind of compliance rates? What, uh, what are those compliance rates? How many people break 
the pledge in a given Congress or I don't know how you measure George, it. Well, George Herbert Walker Bush. Read my lips. Yeah. Yes. And he took the sins of the world on himself so nobody else would have to do that. Um, and then we marched him off into the wilderness like a good scapegoat. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's, that's what happened. Um, nobody's life is a complete waste. Some people serve as bad examples. And uh, children, look at that. Don't do that. Um, I remember my parents pointing out a street person years ago. Don't do that, kids. <laughs> Don't grow up and do that. And they did the same thing with Bush. <laughs> yeah. Don't grow up and raise taxes. This is bad. Uh, when Bush raised taxes – in 1990. He won the, the primary because he signed the pledge and Dole didn't. That's why I beat him in New Hampshire. He won the general because he said, read my lips, no new taxes. He was 14 points down when he said that. He was losing to Mike Dukakis and they said, I'm Ronald Reagan. I won't raise your taxes. People said, oh, we thought you were George Bush. OK, we'll, we'll vote for you. Um, and he won because he was the guy who would not raise taxes. He was going to govern as Reagan's third term. But he didn't. He raised taxes in 90 because his advisors, who are the smartest guys in the world, they tell me, um, <laughs> said, you're allowed to lie to the American people. You know, they don't know. You don't owe them anything. And he bought it. And he treated the people the way French kings would treat peasants, you know, the nerve of these people to ask me. Uh, and Bush said that. He was on one of the, the cover of Parade magazine. He and his wife had this feature. And, and if, where they're supposed to be talking about life and retirement, he sort of lashes out at me. Who is Grover Norquist? <laughs> to raise taxes. What? <laughs> you know, geez, Louise. Um, he keeps bringing up his self-defeating mistake. He had a very successful presidency if you look at um, managing the collapse of the Soviet Union without blood on the floor. A lot of people thought the Soviet Union might go down, but there'd be an awful lot of blood on the floor. He drove Iraq out of Kuwait and didn't get stuck occupying the place for a decade. Um, a lot of wisdom, a lot of common sense. He would have won except for one problem. He raised taxes. He broke his word. And all the Republicans watched that and said, I get it. Take the pledge, win the primary. Take the pledge, win the general. Take, break the pledge, lose. So keep the pledge. And win. We've had almost nobody uh, at the federal level, at the federal, after Bush. After Bush, everyone said, don't do that. Um, and again, this is a guy who was up at 90 percent you know, during the Iraq war and uh, people said he was in fine shape and I said, no, when, when that calms down and people focus on the tax thing, he's still in trouble. Um, and he was. So it's been 25 years since a, a federal Republican. Yeah, there's some the guys at the state problem. level who, um, who break the pledge and um, – former governor of Pennsylvania, uh, signed the pledge, broke it and didn't get reelected. So there's, there's some local – sometimes you have to relearn these things. That, uh, some states are slower than others. Does it ever surprise you – the way people talk about it too and they say, oh, well, Grover released me from the pledge or, or Grover's yes. holding my feet to the fire well, and all good. this way. Yeah. I'm glad that your listenership <laughs> will – they should write this down. The pledge, if you read it, is not to me. It doesn't say, oh, I pledged to Grover Norquist. <laughs> it is to the American people. It is the people of their – it says to the people of my state and the American people uh, that I will vote against and oppose all efforts to raise taxes or if you're running for president, I'll oppose and veto any effort to raise taxes. So the pledge is to the American people which is what means – the idea that somebody could – it's like that uh, scene towards the uh, end of The Godfather Part One. You know, could you get me off the hook for old time's sake? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. <laughs> um, and I have to say to these guys, hey, <laughs> you didn't promise me anything. You promised the voters. You go tell them that you lied to them. Don't come and ask – You know, tell me and like ask for pardon or something. Uh, I did get repeatedly asked, are you the most powerful man in the United States uh, by 60 Minutes when they did a six-hour interview uh, to get about six minutes of airtime. Um, you know, were they looking at your pores? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because they kept asking the same questions and I kept giving them my answer, not the answer they were hoping to write it. They wanted script. you to cackle and say, I am the most powerful yes, man in yes, America. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, and then they beat yeah, me yeah, senseless for the it, next like, yeah. 12 minutes <laughs> of the show. And my, the, my answer uh, was, is the tax issue is the most powerful issue in American history. Go back to the founding of the country. The country almost split. The, my, my book and the IRS before it ends us is – all about the history of taxation and how it shaped the country. Everyone thought the country was going to split 
everything west of the Alleghenies would go to Spain or France or Britain or independent and we would only end up with the short line and that was exacerbated by the whiskey tax. Uh, and, and One of the great of the excise, moments in American history. Yes, yeah, the Whiskey Rebellion. Uh, the excise taxes that they put on, then the excise taxes faded because that's how come Jefferson and the Democrats, Democrat Republicans won for 24 years. They said they'd repeal the tax and they did it. Jefferson's advisors told him, you don't really have to repeal that you know, now that you won. <laughs> Luckily for him there and was the no country. Grover. Was there was there great, 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 great grandpa? He said, no, I think I really do have to do this. <laughs> we weren't lying at the time. Uh, but then the country almost split north-south in 1830. South Carolina called out the militia in 1830-31. The nullification the tariff, crisis. Over the tariff, yeah. yeah. Um, what they wanted to nullify was the tariff. And then the Civil War – there was a big part of the Civil War that was the tariff. If there had never been any slavery, we would have still had the Civil War. It just would have been over the tariffs instead of slavery and tariffs. Uh, so it's been a huge part of American history. It's, it's, it's the – it's a very powerful issue and what, what Americans for Tax Reforms, Taxpayer Protection Pledge does is it clarifies where people stand. You've signed the pledge or you haven't. Very binary. There aren't grays and politicians come to me and say, well, I've never raised taxes. I said, if my neighbor came and said, I've never eaten your cat but I won't put in writing that I won't. <laughs> I would keep the cat inside. Yeah. <laughs> now, the book, as you mentioned, is called In the IRS Before It Ends Us. Um, is that uh, title too hyperbolic? It is not. It wasn't my choice but I didn't – the publisher liked it. I like it now. Um, I think it's not too hyperbolic. For two, there are two ways in which you mean get rid of the IRS. The first is the way that Bill Clinton said get rid of welfare as we know it. Get rid of the IRS that's political, that, that is corrupt, that uh, targets people that they don't like, uh, that has you know, six you – know, the, the, the amount of time and effort uh, that people have to put into it, the number of, of uh, pages in the code. It's, it's much too complicated. It's much too crazy. No one can fully understand it or even comply and not break the rules somehow, not meaning to. And you've seen the ones you have to ask 10 different people to do the same tax reform, t t tax uh, payment mm -hmm. and they get 10 different answers mm -hmm. from experts. Mm -hmm. And nine of those guys the government could decide should go to jail because they tried to cheat you. So I think that ending the IRS as we know it, even if you kept the income tax, is a necessary step. It's not sufficient. You wouldn't want a pleasant structure that still took 20 percent of GDP and, and disincentivized work saving and investment. Can we do without the income tax, federal income tax? Well, the first answer is we did till 1913. So obviously you can. Uh, there are nine states that don't have income taxes. Never have. Well, Alaska had it and then they didn't. But nine states that don't have income taxes. Uh, as we get more and more states deciding to shed the income tax, Kansas is on track to do that, North Carolina, Mississippi has been taking votes to put themselves on that track, watch uh, Arizona and Maine. These states are all saying our goal is to get to zero. Uh, we have a campaign 50 and 2050, which is to have 50 states without a state income tax by 2050. And I don't expect to do any campaigning in New York or California or Illinois. I expect to win all the states around them and drain the swamp of talent, youth <laughs> and resources and jobs and California will get the joke or they won't. That's like another guerrilla action. It is. Yeah. It is. We will, we, will, we will take the countryside and surround the cities and starve them out from, for capital people and, and young people. Uh, so I think there's some real – the answer is yes. I think we can get there. But it does take a very serious focus on reducing the size and scope of government, on reforming all our pensions to make them defined contribution rather than defined benefit, to take all of the uh, welfare structures and block grant them to the states. So you have the 57 states compete on you know, how to provide these programs and to get costs down. Uh, so I, I think that we can get there. The first part – should be done in the next few years. The second part will take decades. 
No, I want to call you. You said 57 states. You meant all the territories in D.C. And no, I'm making fun of the president. Oh, OK. Did he say that? that yes. Was, yeah. Oh, oh, I did. Oh, OK. Well, I, I missed the joke. But. He, had, he had talked about visiting all 57 states oh, okay. during the campaign. <laughs> what is the appropriate – If Quayle had said that, you, <laughs> you would never you have had it memorized. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what is the appropriate amount of taxes? Lower. Less. OK. Samuel Gompers, who's – Statue is like across the street and I keep waiting for you guys to like put a mustache on or something. But <laughs> Samuel Gomper's labor um, leader in the 1870s, 1880s who hated Chinese and Japanese people but um, otherwise was an interesting character. He – when asked what do working people want, he said more. I mean there isn't some number. What do we want? We want government to cost less. We want it to be more efficient, more effective and less intrusive in people's lives. So uh, 20 percent – of GDP spent by the federal government is too high. 10 percent strikes me as probably still too high. But when we get to 10 percent, we'll have a conversation with the nation and if everyone says this is swell, uh, I'll retire and write murder mysteries. But my guess is we'll keep going to 9, 8, 7 and, and see how far now, we can go. Now, at what point can you drown in a bathtub? Because that, that, that quote, it's amazing. Would that surprise you how much that quote has followed you around? Of, of Well, it is. It's um, because the, the original quote, the full quote is, my goal – this comes to what do you want? My goal is to reduce the size and scope of government as a percentage of the, con of the economy in half over 25 years um, and then in the next 25 years to drop it in half again. And then I think the question was, do you keep going? I said, well, ultimately you want to reduce the government down to the size where you could drag it into the bathroom and drown it in the bathtub. <laughs> uh, so that's that's the exaggeration. But the first two are, are, are I believe, exactly what, what we can do, what we should do. Uh, take government from 20 percent of GDP down to 10 and then from 10 to 5. You know, as the economy grows, it's not the government doesn't have to get teeny but just teeny smaller compared to the rest of our resources. What's the path to getting there? Because on the one hand, Getting Americans to get upset at politicians who raise their taxes from whatever they happen to be now is – I mean people don't want to pay more than they are um, and everyone would like to pay less. But as you mentioned, getting – I mean really dramatically yeah. reducing the, the size of government is going to involve doing away with pension programs and replacing them with you know, uh, savings and – at some point, you know, people people love to pay less but then they're not so willing to give up the things that – they have. I mean, you start running into American voter constituencies that are benefiting from this stuff. Yeah, I think it's overstated the actual desire that people have for bigger government. Half of the federal government, federal government is twenty percent of the economy. Half, ten percent of the economy, was enacted in two two-year periods. So four years of American history created half of our federal government: thirty-four to thirty-six, uh, New Deal, and sixty-four to sixty-six, Medicare, Medicaid. Social Security, food stamps. So there were some uh, seeds planted in those that four, those four years, and it happened when you had several landslides in a row for the Democrats. They had super majorities; they could do everything they wanted, and they put in seeds that over time grew. And it was never easy enough to cut down the tree or, or prune it back because it just kept growing. What the Ryan budget plan does, Paul Ryan's budget plan, I write about that in the book, is that it makes all these reforms now but they're all ones that over time bend down the cost curve of government to where instead of 30, 40 years now costing 40 percent of GDP, it takes it from 20 back to 20. And that's assuming no economic growth from, from better policies. I, I think it does much better than that. But at a minimum, it cuts government in half over the next 30, 40 years from where it would otherwise be. And that you do by reforming government, not cutting it. If you want to cut something 10 percent, it's like chopping somebody's head off. It's scary. But if you say we're going to lose weight and you do it over time, that's a lot easier to deal with. You, you, you do it all at once. Chopping somebody's arm off is scary. But allowing somebody to lose weight over time is not scary um, and it's, it's healthy. So. Uh, this, this is where I think we're in a position to – and you need to get 51 votes in the Senate, a majority in the House, which is four times voted for the Paul Ryan's plan and a Republican president with enough digits to sign the bill. Uh, and then that puts you on a U-turn from our present road to serfdom. I mean presently we're going to Hades 
not as quick as we were three years ago, but we're still heading in the wrong direction. We're going to end up like France and no one will bathe or anything. So we need to, <laughs> we need to fix this. Um, is that going to be too much of a bitter pill though because – dovetailing off of Aaron's question, would those kind of cuts – it would hurt some people you're kind of, at some point. And would that mean that if you actually signed that plan, if you were president who signed that plan, you would probably lose the next election? Well, the President of the United States just signed a bill which in net present value drops federal spending by three trillion dollars. That was the doc fix bill. In the first ten years, the government spends a hundred billion more than it did, and that's what they focused on. Politicians like street criminals have 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 short time horizons. I will smash the window, I will steal the watch and run away. <laughs> I will go to jail. <laughs> Damn, I didn't think this all the way through. Okay. <clears throat> Politicians, if you say shiny thing here, and all you have to do is bend the cost curve on some of these Medicare payments down, not cut them in half, right? just, just bend the cost curve down to where over the next 75 years, the net present value is $3 trillion. Over time, it's a lot more than that. But – and that's what the deal will be, that here is something today to make you happy. The price of that it, and the, what you get is not a tax increase but a one-time spending deal. Then in the future, you alter the – cost curve on entitlements and you can drop trillions um, in real time. So could a Republican president do that? Well, a Democrat president just did. Three trillion, not bad. Hmm. Does, doesn't that commit us to trusting them in the future though? <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't because uh, this, is, this, is, this is a law in the same way that Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid grew. They were just a law. Nobody, nobody went in and said, now we will add to this, now we will add to this <clears throat> on a regular basis. It just grew over, over time because of the way it was designed. And so those reforms, um, if you move from defined uh, benefit to defined contribution, tremendous savings but nobody has to touch it again. It just, it just happens. It's in the structure. If you were saying, oh, 50 years from now, the appropriators promise to behave. No, that I would not trust. <laughs> now, in your, you mentioned the tax revolts, which is a, a big part of the uh, first part of your book. And, uh, and in the stats you have here, uh, we don't have income tax until 1913. The top rate then was 7 percent on people who earned $500,000 or more, which would be $11.5 million in yes. today's numbers. Only 4 percent of Americans even paid income tax. At all now, about half of American families pay income tax, and the bottom rate is ten percent, which is higher than the top rate in 1913. Do you think that Americans have become a little bit too, given our anti-tax roots, have we become too complacent about this level of taxation we're experiencing? Oh yes, absolutely. But when you remind people of how much they're paying, uh, we finally defeated the Spanish-American war tax, which is a 3 percent federal excise tax on long-distance phone calls. Simply, <laughs> I have a question. That, that story is amazing with its, itself. Simply by uh, paying attention by, – by focusing on it. Look at this. This is a hidden tax. They think you're an idiot. You're still paying for the Spanish-American. People were then outraged about a tax. They couldn't have told you they were paying because it was hidden in their phone bill. So when you highlight the cost of something, people will react. And, and we can get people to change their mind about whether or not they're willing to tolerate something. Now, you described that Spanish-American war tax, which is just a funny sentence by itself. Uh, this, remember the main, you know, <laughs> yes, remember yes. the tax. Uh, when you describe it as the perfect tax in your, because it has all these elements to it and it just it, it persisted for it's, it. It doesn't really exist anymore. But it's mostly gone. It's not completely gone. It's mostly gone. Um, but how did it come about in the original? What was the idea? Sure. Um, 1898 when Spain so violently attacked us and we had to defend ourselves. Um, we needed to <laughs> – And take over Guam and the Philippines yes, and Taipan. Right. The... Serve them. Right. <laughs> um, they, they put in a tax, a tax on long-distance phone calls charged by time and distance. At the time, a phone was $5,000 in today's dollars. Very few people had phones. Very few people made long-distance phone calls. And uh, so it's a tax on the rich people. So of all the things politicians do to trick you into agreeing to a tax increase, this nation found in a tax revolt, oh, it's only rich people. OK. Oh, it's only temporary because we're having a war with Spain. Well, it last forever, right? It's falling <laughs> apart as it is. OK. It's patriotic. It's a war. Okay. Uh, Henry James, the only taxes people like to pay are war taxes. That's why everything needed to be the moral equivalent of war in order to trick you into having higher taxes. The energy crisis, moral equivalent of war. Jimmy Carter, he had read his Henry James. Um, and so all of this stuff, um, it was hidden in the bottom of your phone bill. 
So all of these things combined to make it uh, really the perfect tax. It lasted more than 100 years. Uh, it then became a tax on everybody because 98, 99 percent of Americans have phones and only really rich people can afford not to have a phone. <laughs> so uh, we went from a tax on the rich to a tax on average people. Uh, came out at 3 percent and we eventually got it mostly killed by focusing on it. Hmm. And it was a – but Clinton at one point did veto. A, a, he right? did. We had it all gone and Clinton vetoed it. It was part of another package of things and Clinton was the keeper of the Spanish-American war tax. <laughs> so yeah, and you also write about more about uh, um, just the relation between war and taxation in general. Yeah, there's a long chapter. I mean every time they have a war, the war ends and the taxes don't. The only war that really closed down all the taxes at the end of the war was the War of 1812. Uh, oh, those were the days. All the others, not only the taxes stayed, but the level of spending stayed up uh, more than before uh, the war. Uh, Civil War, government was sort of permanently made larger, uh, and you saw this again with the Civ with with the First World War and the Second World War. Government kept getting bigger. Now, we used to spend ten percent of national spending on Pentagon in the sixties. And now it's down to about three, four percent. But government's as big as it was because that money was just absorbed by other parts of the government. So our friends on the left, they like wars because it means more money for the government, and they're willing to wait to get their piece of it till after the war ends. Which may be why they run anti-war campaigns to <laughs> end the war quickly and keep the taxes. Um, but but they 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 do. And there's some of the books that I'd looked at researching this. I'm reading these left-wing books, and they're so excited about all the taxes that the war generated. I'm going, but you were against that war. <laughs> and, World War One was, of course, World War One and and Vietnam. But they love the taxes that What's came wrong with, with Vietnam. What's seeing a silver lining? That's right. In you know, <laughs> other people's deaths and misery. Uh, <laughs> the so, but yes. Wars, war is the health of the state mm. and it is how you grow the government and then it doesn't snap back. One of the things, the one I can think of at present that George W. Bush did right was he kept all the spending in Iraq and Afghanistan in a separate uh, overseas contingency thing. So there's this emergency bill they had to pass. And the first couple of times it happened, I said, wait a minute. Who are you trying to fool? What do you mean there's an emergency? You got 100,000 guys over there. You didn't know. Why don't you put it in the budget? And some smart person said, Grover, come here. We're not putting it in the budget because if you put it in the budget, when the war ends, it all goes over into other spending and it gets absorbed. Um, whereas this way, when it ends, it's not in the baseline. And the first victory we had over Obama was when we faced him off in 2011, we took the uh, trillion dollars he was planning on spending over the next decade. As soon as Iraq and Afghanistan ended, he was putting that all into the baseline to spend on other stuff. And that's what we took away first. Can that you, was the easy way of doing it. That, for those who don't uh, – I sure. think this is an important point. A lot of uh, listeners may not understand baseline budgeting and what this sort of ledger domain is when they when they voice these things on it. Can you, so can you explain how that works? Trevor Burrus Sure. When they say the government spent more or spent less, they mean compared to what? Compared to plants. And uh, under Bush, they were spending $100 billion a year on Afghanistan, so a trillion dollars over a decade. To end the war would mean that that $100 billion every year was now if, – if you had it in the baseline budget, it's now part of the budget. But we don't need it for the wars. So we'll – everybody will grab it and take it for other parts. But if it's not in the baseline budget, if it's off in some separate budget, when it ends, nobody gets any more money. Trevor And that's how you can say though too. So when they say you cut – you're cutting government over time even though it's still growing but at a lower rate or it's growing at a higher rate. It's cutting from their – from their plans, from their hopes, from their expectations, from their desires. They, I wanted two ice cream cones. I got one. And I was cut. <laughs> I was planning on having seven ice cream cones in the future. Now you lowered it to six. That's right. And so now you've did a cut. In the Even though I only cones. have five now. Yeah, exactly. We have no idea how to produce the sixth one. Yes. Let me <clears throat> ask a question similar lines of the ways of Washington are a mystery to people outside the Beltway. When you say things like – They're a mystery was, to me inside <clears throat> the Beltway. Yes. So, so. Um, you know, this was – we had this victory. We being Americans for Tax Reform had yeah. this victory against Obama. What is that? What does that mean? Like what are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis to achieve these victories? Is yeah, other than sure. wearing your hood and having your secret meetings with your candles and your cackling and all that yeah. stuff. That's an important part of your the job. The incantations are key. Yes, exactly. Uh, 
We work to build a broad coalition opposing tax increases to start with. So it, it is a guardrail that you can't get past. Uh, and it's terribly reasonable because on this side of the guardrail, you can do anything you want. It doesn't violate the pledge. But with the guardrail, we were able to stop Obama's plans for additional spending and taxes. And the Republicans held, the Republican leadership held and said, we need two and a half trillion in spending cuts, not tax increases, spending cuts. And Obama for the longest time would hear deficit reduction when we were talking about spending reduction. And this is so important for conservatives, Republicans, libertarians, limited government people. We should always focus on spending and never on the deficit because there are two ways to fix the deficit. Spend less. Oh, that's boring. The Washington Post is not interested. Uh, or raise taxes. Oh, that's endlessly fascinating. And so if the problem is the deficit, the Democrats have a solution that is technically every bit as good as the Republican solution, which is raise taxes. But if the problem is too much spending, there are only two ways to fix it. Cut spending, which the left doesn't have an interest in, or grow the, gov grow the economy so that the same size government becomes a smaller part of it, a smaller problem. And free market economists, free market advocates have lots of ways to make the economy grow more. The friends on the left have no idea how to make the government grow more. They, they can't you – know, they, they, they stick the trial lawyers on it like, like leeches. They stick the labor unions on it. They tax it. They regulate. They spend it and the thing's just bleeding all over from leeches and it doesn't get healthy. It doesn't get better. They don't have any plans to make the government grow faster. You mean the economy or the government? The, I'm sorry. The, the, the economy. The economy. The economy. They have plenty of reasons and arguments for making the government to get bigger, uh, which doesn't help the economy grow. So I, I think it's very, very helpful and important to focus on total government spending as a percentage of the economy. Grow the economy. That's good. Reduce the size of government. That's good. If you focus on the deficit, you don't get either of those. Now you have some interesting uh, – there's a lot of – it's not just complaints in your book. You have a lot of proposals for actually oh, how yeah. no winding in there. No <laughs> the um, uh, so one of the one more interesting ones for spending that you mentioned is your idea for the sort of spending brack uh, yeah. type of thing, which I've actually thought about before. Because sometimes Congress they're just you know they're like an alcoholic, and you got to take away the liquor, and you know you put it on the shelf and don't let us don't even give it to me if I ask type of thing. So how, what was brack and how would that kind of work? Brack uh, base realignment and closure. Uh, was how we began to reduce the number of unnecessary military bases. Dick Armey and a Republican, conservative Republican from Texas and a sharp liberal Democrat from Indiana together came up with this idea that the Pentagon would come up with a list of bases they didn't particularly want anymore. There were many. And then you'd have this bipartisan group that would look at them and choose some of them and then unless Congress voted no, that list would be closed down or reorganized. You could move half of the guys somewhere. And this allowed everybody to vote for creating the BRAC so that it would happen. And then when their state or city was going to lose a military base that nobody needed um, but they thought it was nice to have the federal money flowing in, they could vote against it but it didn't get you the two-thirds to defeat it. And therefore, it happened. So we got to vote yes or no. So you got cover and all this cover thing, yeah. and the right thing happened. You could do that with uh, the number of uh, post offices. There are many more post offices than necessary in the United States. That's probably. I mean, more than one is more than necessary. Yes, yeah, <laughs> you can take that. You can take that as far as one wants to go. But there are a lot of um, government programs that you could prune back this way. I think we should do the same thing with federal laws. There are 4,000 federal laws that could send you to prison. Do you really need 4,000? There used to be 39, I think, when they started the country off. Uh, and I don't know what all 39 were. I you know, sure I could remember them. But Piracy I, was one of them. I, yes. yes, I certainly can't remember the 4,000. Uh, so I think it's, it's extremely helpful to come up with ideas. You set up a BRAC and then unless Congress acts, these things fade. Um, also the Anti-Appropriations Committee. Is this, I love this because it's real. Uh, there was actually something called the Byrd Committee which is named after Harry Byrd, uh, fiscal conservative sort of out of Virginia. And he wanted to fund World War II by cutting other spending and he set up a committee uh, called the Byrd Committee. Uh, I call it the Anti-Appropriations Committee. This group could only recommend cutting the budget. So they write bills and they hand it to the House and Senate and sometimes they pass them. That's how we got rid of the Civilian Conservation Corps. That's how we got rid of the Work Projects Administration. 
these things would still be with us. I mean, Civilian Conservation Corps over 50, 60, 70 years would have morphed into national service if it hadn't been shut down to take that money and pay for World War II. I am hopeful that we will get this bill restarted up in the next year, that we can pass it in the next two or three years. And then people like Jeff Flake of Alabama and Massey and Justin Amash could fight to get on the committee to unspend. And that but, could be a great campaigning thing. At this oh, point. you could you could have press conferences. You could get attention to yourself. You would have actual deliverables. Here is what I saved you. This is the bill I wrote. We cut this budget in half or in ten percent. Or and what they did with the bird community, they cut something in a quarter, then in a half, and then they. And then get rid of it. Um, Drown in the bathtub. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so I think there's some real opportunities there. Um, and the book has a series of a uh, couple dozen solutions to different things. Why the focus exclusively on taxes? I mean, government does lots of really awful things to us and restricts the way we can live in all sorts of ways. And taking money out of our pockets is part of that, but certainly not all of it. Taking money out of people's pockets enables the government to do everything else because it has that money. It can also do other stuff because it has that control over your life. It can control other things. So I think it's it's the pressure point that you start taking away their power. Um, you're right. When you don't let them tax and you don't let them spend, they will regulate. But uh, – Water always tries to find a way around a dam. Power always tries to find a way around restrictions on power. And that shouldn't surprise you. You just go, OK, we're going to ask once we've stopped the tax increases, once we've limited spending, we are going to have to deal with judiciary, judicial power and executive orders, that sort of thing. Um, that's not a, – that's a problem but it's one you anticipate and you just have to live with. Um, so we have two – there are two proposals you talk about in the IRS. You, see, you bring up fair tax and flat tax. Um, fair, fair tax, what is the fair tax? Is one proposal for kind of – Sure. Fair tax is a retail sales tax, uh, the idea that you get rid of the income tax, abolish the 16th Amendment and you have a VAT or a, a sales tax uh, that is collected not from you but from the store you buy something when you buy a hamburger or shirt. Sales tax. Mm. Now, both the and the flat tax is you take the present income tax, you have a single rate, and you broaden it out, and uh, you have very low rates compared to what we have today. Simpler. And I think they're both an improvement uh, over what we have. They both uh, bring you to taxing consumed income one time at one rate. So. An economist would look at the two and say they're the same darn thing. Why are you asking me to pick between them? People look at them differently. I won't have to do the taxes. Some business guy will. <laughs> Since more and more people are going to be self-employed and we're going to have hundreds of thousands of Uber drivers who pay their own taxes instead of you know a few thousand taxi cab um, – unionized taxi cab guys who the company fills out your tax form. Uh, we're moving to a world with more independent contractors and fewer employees. So I'm not sure how much it buys you to um, – You think that will create a, a more of a movement to simplify the tax code possibly because people will be doing their own taxes and the withholding will not be – they're kind of – if they're independent contractors and they don't have withholding and then you write a check to the government. They notice the taxes more. Yes, that would that would have an impact and I think it is having an impact, the Uber, uh, Uber Lyft, Airbnb and more everything and more else people coming being, up. Yeah, then the number of people – and it's great because the journalists these days have several jobs because – one company can't hire somebody necessarily. People have several jobs and they're independent contractors. And once they get it, it's easier for them to write about it intelligently. Hmm. So the Tea Party seemed to have changed things. Would you would you agree? Do you think it's a different era now? Oh, absolutely. Party? This idea where people whine like the Tea Party completely disappeared, they're wrong. They went to Congress. It, it changed the world. It uh, changed the direction and the trajectory of the modern Republican Party. We were the party that – the Republican Party's party that would not raise your taxes. Now, they may invade small countries. They can't pronounce but they <laughs> wouldn't raise your taxes. That was the good selling point and what won a lot of elections, won the House for them. Uh, but as Bush showed us, Bush, George W. Bush, um, he never had a focus on limiting spending. It was just never on the list of things to do. You'd go talk to their guys and when you had an idea to spend less, they'd sort of look at you blankly like you were – 
you know, what are you talking about? Uh, it wasn't on their to-do list. Uh, I mean, they'd probably be offended by that, but they never brought it up. They never pushed it. It wasn't what they did. And every time there was a crisis, they, their, the answer to the crisis was more government. So it's not like they had a bunch of small government plans and whenever there's a crisis, like Rahm Emanuel said, oh, here's my solution written 10 years ago. But this is applicable to this crisis. Let's have limited government. That is what you should be doing. That is what competent governors do. Uh, but Bush didn't. And so there was a, a frustration by average people who were otherwise well disposed towards Bush and the Republicans about spending. And Obama came in and really went crazy on the spending. And people said, OK, this is it. This is scary. I had thought that you could never get the American people to rise up and revolt against spending too much, that they would be – you'd have to wait until spend too much turned into a tax increase. Then the pitchforks would come out and everybody would go crazy. People in the 70s in California didn't have a revolution. It wasn't until all of that spending upward drift turned into tax increases on your home. Then people said, now we've had it with you. Well, where were we in the last 10 years when this was coming? As clear as day, this was coming. I didn't see it. Because of the speed with which Obama raised spending, the aggressive nature of it, the understanding that there was nothing in Washington that could stop them from doing anything because they had 60 – The lack of any votes on Republican side. Yeah. So just sort of you know, F them uh, as, as Rahm Emanuel said. Yeah. Well, the, the Republican – every Republican voted against Obamacare, period. And, and the D still had – they could just pass it. So the people got scared. And you had a very strong reaction on spending. And so the people who got elected in 2010, which was dozens and dozens and dozens of congressmen and senators, all came in with ringing in their ears, stop spending, stop earmarks, stop spending, no TARP, no bailouts. Changes the nature of who you are. When you come into office, you learn what the people want. And there are people who 30 years later were voting as if the, reset, the Great Depression was still on in, you know, in the 60s from the 30s. And those guys coming in are going to be focused on spending as long as they stay in Washington, D.C. So the Tea Party changed the, the direction of the modern Republican Party to be not, not just the party that won't raise your taxes but the party that fights spending. And that's a big deal. So is tax reform urgent? And um, I guess the, other, the last question would be, are you optimistic? I'm um, optimistic long term. Nothing terribly interesting happens until Obama moves on because he'll veto anything too good, although he just signed a $3 trillion net present value cut in spending. So I'm, I'm open to possible deals. He's supporting a trade agreement, uh, which he would never have done in the first six years of his presidency. So th there may be some opportunities that pop up. We should just be ready. And so there are people planning tax reform packages in case he wakes up one morning and says, I need a legacy. Let's do lower marginal tax rates. I'm not counting on it. I don't think that's the way to bet. But you, why not be ready? But overall, in the longer term, oh sure, going, we're going to win. You're optimistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things are going in the right direction. We finally have federalism working in a way that's going to help drive the country in the right direction. As people leave, are leaving high tax states and big spending states, and moving to low tax states, the electoral college is collapsing into the red states. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at FreeThoughtsPod. That's FreeThoughtsPod. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.